You are so welcome in this place. We're glad that you're here today. We pray that you've got a, a smile on your face and a, a light in your heart. God loves you, and so do we. Uh, we're so thankful you're here. It's uh, uh, a, kind of an odd time. Usually, uh, I was talking with several families this week, one family, um, a, a couple of them told me, I'll, we'll be gone for three weeks, and I'm like, three weeks? Good night. So, summer slump sometimes hit, but hits, but we're glad that you're here, and we know that many are uh, worshiping with us by um, means of cyber, whether it's a computer or an electronic device, and we welcome them as well. This is the day the Lord has made. The psalmist says, be glad and rejoice in it, and that's what we seek to do. Uh, for all of our guests, uh, you are most welcome in this place. If uh, you'd like to know more about our church or have a visit or contact, there's a QR code on the bulletin, and there's some connect cards uh, in the pews, fill that out, drop it in one of the offering plates that's situated around the sanctuary, and we're glad that you're here. For all of our members and attenders, we're glad that you're here. We pray that you know how valuable, how vibrant, how integral you are to the body of Christ here at First Baptist Church. You are loved, you're valued, and you're accepted. May God bless you, and may you join us in blessing the Lord in worship today. He is the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, and he is light in the darkness. And we worship him this morning in the beauty of his holiness. I invite you to stand in his presence. He's here and he loves you with an everlasting love as a child to a loving father run to him.
And your presence is all around us. And even when we can't see it, you are working. And you tell us in your word, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. And I will uphold you with the strength of my right hand. Father God, we remember your faithfulness, all your mighty deeds, for you are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the people. And Father, we just pray that just now you would show us your glory through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And in the name of Jesus, amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Psalm 91. It's a scripture that gives us hope and a scripture of deliverance. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the air that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And this is the word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God, God for his word. The hymn writer states, Morning by morning new mercies I see all I've needed your hand has provided great is your faithfulness Lord unto me
New, Test New Testament scripture this morning comes from the book of Hebrews. I'll be reading from the ch uh, 11th chapter, verses 1 through 6. A challenge to put our faith into action. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. And there are so many ways as followers of Jesus Christ that we can put our faith into action. We know the importance of sharing our faith with those around us. We know the importance of studying God's word, coming to worship. But another way in which we can put our faith into action is when we give. Because it is a reminder to us that we are to put our faith in God and God alone and not the things of this world. And here at First Baptist Church, we use our tithes and our offerings to bless this community and even the world around us through the creation of missions and ministry opportunities, things like VBS that will be coming up, we have so many opportunities, and so we want to thank you in advance for your support of our missions and ministries here at First Baptist Church. On your way out this morning, if you prefer to give in person, we have offering plates around the sanctuary. We also have online giving opportunities, text giving, or you can even mail in your tithes and your offerings. But whatever way you choose to give, know that it will honor God and know that it will certainly bless so many lives and help them to come to know Jesus Christ just as you and I do. Let's go to God now in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we just thank you first and foremost for this opportunity to come and to worship you. And God, as we come into your presence, we can't help but be encouraged by all that you do. But God, we are so excited and thankful that you invite us to be a part of your great kingdom work here in this community and even around the world. And so God, now as we come to give you our tithes and our offerings, God, may you bless them far beyond measure. And may all that is given be given out of faith knowing that, God, you are real, that you do exist, and that most importantly, God, you love each and every one of us. For we pray all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen.
a journey we walk by faith and there'll always be a mountain in our way but right here in this moment may our strength be renewed as we Sometimes through the darkness, it's hard to see. But just be brave and follow where he leads. Greater is the one who's in us than he who's in the world. So child of God, remember.
What a great day of worship it has already been as we come here to worship the one true living God, God our Father, creator of the universe, God the Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. And now we invoke the Holy Spirit of God to move in our hearts and in our midst as he is here. And we seek to be drawn closer to the Lord through this time of worship. I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. For context, this passage that we will read, if you're using a pew Bible today, you'll find that on page 1,470. If you're a guest or, or not, if you uh, don't have a Bible and would like one, please take one of the Bibles here. We uh, restore them in the pews all the time. It's our gift to you if you don't have a Bible, and we invite you to read it. It's the greatest revelation of God to us through His Word, the greatest revelation of Jesus, who is the greatest revelation of the Father. And we encourage you to read it. For context, this passage, which is often um, uh, shared about the faith of the centurion, that's the header for this paragraph in my Bible, comes on the heels of the greatest sermon ever preached. Um, as uh, in chapter 6, Jesus preaches uh, people from all um, of the region of Jerusalem, Galilee, the coast, came to hear him. Uh, it is the Sermon on the Plain in Matthew 5 through 7. We have the, par uh, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And it's in that context that now Jesus, he's preaching this, most scholars believe, and I believe, uh, in the region of, of Capernaum. Capernaum, uh, in Jesus' day, was a smaller town. It was about a population of 1,500 on the northwest edge of the Sea of Galilee. It's a very beautiful place. It's a... Uh, kind of a rolling slope down to the sea. And it's there that we believe Jesus embraced Capernaum as a kind of second hometown. Because, as you know, he was born in Bethlehem. Um, and then he fled to Egypt, was raised in Nazareth. But in chapter 6 um, of Luke, we find that he's basically uh, pushed out. He... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe in chapter 4. He, um, he opens the, the scriptures in the synagogue, turns to Isaiah, begins to preach on it, and um, they don't like his message to the point that they take him out of the synagogue, they go up to the cliff at the foundation of the city, and they're going to throw him over to kill Christ. But he passes right through them and goes on about his, his business. He says that a prophet is only without honor in his own hometown. And so Jesus embraced Capernaum, and here, uh, though it is a smaller town, if you will, very beautiful, uh, he encounters this situation. And if you'll read with me now from verse 1, chapter 7 of the Gospel of Luke. When Jesus had finished saying all this, this being the Sermon on the Plain, in the hearing of all the people, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion servant whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and he has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this. And he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. The sermon is entitled, Jesus Finding Faith. Jesus Finding Faith. Unlike most of the other uh, sermons that I preach, um, it would not be the 
common thing to have a centurion be the, the central focus of a, of a parable or an anecdote. And in this, Jesus has as this centurion the central figure of the story. Now, we must know what a centurion is. Probably everybody knows here, but some may not. And a centurion um, has a root word the same for century, meaning a hundred. Most of the time, a centurion commanded uh, a contingent of a hundred men. Some scholars and philosophers say that the centurions were the backbone of the Roman legion. In a manner of speaking, and I don't want to take too many liberties, but I would consider them the sergeants of the Roman legion. Um, in my past, when I was in military training, um, I had officers who taught me. Most of the professors and the, the teachers were officers, but some were enlisted men, non-commissioned officers, and both groups <coughs> taught me a great, great deal. When I was in um, ROTC, we went for training at a North Carolina base, and um, at the time, I was actually it was a junior ROTC in high school, and I was in the 10th grade. And in my squadron, there was a 12th grader who I played football with, and he was a starting fullback on the football team. I would have never told him this, but, you know, the truth will set you free. I was a little intimidated by this man. He was a man among men on the football team. Uh, truly, I'll just tell you, I was afraid of him. He was, a, he was a specimen. I tackled him once in practice, and I hit him with everything I had. I hit him in the thighs, and I kid you not, I still bear the scars. It busted open my brow, and I had to have stitches. And I had a helmet on. I mean, this was a man, even at 18. I won't call his name because I've not seen him in a couple of decades, and I'm still just a little afraid of him, so I wouldn't want to. <laughs> and so we went <coughs> to um, a North Carolina base, and um, our master sergeant that taught us, uh, Sergeant Bonderer, a good man, a good patriot, a godly man. The godly man was the best part of him. And he instructed us what to do and what not to do, and he said, when you get on the flight line, you listen to these drill instructors. You don't play with them. You don't make jokes. You don't try to be cute or funny. Do what they say. And this fullback looked at me. He said, you know, that, that guy wearing that hat, I'm going to get me one of those hats, that little Smokey Bear hat that drill instructors wear, wear that some uh, our, our uh, sheriffs in Ardo County wear those kind of hats. And when he said that, I said, you want a hat like that? He said, no, I want that. I'm going to take his hat. And I was like, I don't know. And, and the gentleman who was the drill instructor was he was about five foot six he was shorter than all of us he was in great shape a taut um sinewy african-american drill instructor and and i was afraid of him too i guess you know i'm thinking of the scripture pure uh, pure love casts out fear but these were intimidating people now my friend was about six three probably about 205 210 pounds and no fat on him and i i don't know in his mind but as he was whipping us into shape and pulling the reins tight, that, that diminutive drill instructor got in front of that fullback I was so afraid of, looked up, read him to riot act, and when I had the nerve after he had gone back to his station, I turned around and looked, my friend was just crying. He was crying like crazy. I thought, good night. If he can make that fullback cry like that, I don't want to do anything to offend him. <clears throat> I say that because sergeants, um, my most favorite officer of all time, a war hero from World, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. He told me, Jerry, I know that you're, you're moving towards all this, but he said, when you become an officer, always remember that the sergeants and the non-coms, the non-commissioned officers, are the backbone of the service. Don't look down on them. Don't denigrate them. Appreciate them. And that, that rang with me. I can't help but think about that when I read about this centurion. Now, most centurions were not held in high regard by the Jews. Really, the Romans were hated by the Jews. Um, they were an occupying force. They represented everything that was apart from uh, the, the scriptures, the Old Testament, and the New. They worshipped men. They worshipped idols. They worshipped false gods. And they had conquered them, and one of the conquerors, the emperor, had desecrated the temple, the most holy place, and the holy of holies, they had desecrated that place and forever pushed away 
and, and um, ostracized the Jewish people. But here we have an episode where Jesus is there. He's been teaching and preaching and healing. And this centurion sends some elders of the Jews. Now, we need to understand this, that he's concerned not for himself, but for his servant, his slave. Doulos is the word in Greek. Now, I, I did a little research because I knew this, but I wanted to share with you just so we have a, an understanding of how this centurion would have mostly be held by the Jewish uh, and the Gentile, to some extent, nation uh, earlier. The ancient historian Polybius uh, said that a centurion must not so much be a seeker after danger as a man who can command, steady in action and reliable. They ought not to be over anxious to rush into the fight, but when hard pressed, they must be ready to hold their ground and die at their posts. And so he wants to save his slave. He believes that Jesus, this itinerant Jewish perhaps prophet, some say the Messiah, he has enough regard and enough faith that he sends for Jesus, believing that Jesus can heal his servant. And so he sends these Jewish elders. And these Jewish elders, they come and they find Jesus. It's not that hard to find Jesus. People are around him. They're thronging to hear his words. They're thronging to have his healing. And the same is true today. We live in a nation where so many people are lost without Christ. And it burdens my heart. We have a heart for evangelism and sharing the gospel here at First Baptist Church. But I would say to those who are lost or those who are indifferent or those who are rebelling or going astray from God, he's not hard to find. He's a prayer away. He's always there to listen. He hears when any prayer is offered. He's there to heal. He's still in the healing business. He is there most of all, I would say, to save. That was his purpose. He said the Son of Man came to save, to seek, and to save that which was lost. Those of us who was lost, that was his purpose. And if anybody is searching for Jesus, for the ultimate healing, which is that of our sin, he can be found. These Jewish elders found him. Most of the Jewish elders, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, the scribes, they didn't want to find Christ. He threatened who they were. He threatened their power. He threatened the establishment, but he can be found. For anyone here or anyone in our society, Christ is just there for the praying to, for the asking him into our heart, for the asking him to heal us. Jesus is ready to be found. And they found him. <clears throat> and it's remarkable to me that these elders, in a manner of speaking, once they find Jesus, they lobby for the centurion. The scriptures tell us that when they found Jesus, the centurion had sent them. Verse 4, when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. They pleaded, they asked, they put their petition forward. And they say, this man deserves to have you do this. Now that's remarkable because here is a symbol of the Roman power of occupying all of Palestine. And even in a small place like Capernaum, they want to keep the people in line. Now, it was true that the Romans often encouraged their occupying forces to encourage people to go about their religions, whether they were for seeking the one true living God or pagan religions, so that the people could be pacified, if you will. But these Jews, knowing that the Romans had desecrated their temple, these particular el uh, elders said, Lord, he deserves this. And the reason he deserves this is because he loves our nation. He wasn't taking advantage. He loves our nation. He had demonstrated that with his attitudes, with his actions, with his concern. And out of his love for the Jews, they say to him, uh, to Christ, he has built our synagogue. Now, one of the things we say amen to today is God has blessed us and utilized you as a congregation to rebuild this sanctuary. Can you imagine if you did that on your own? The vast expense? Or building an institution, a church, a synagogue, a temple? What that would cost? And in that we see the character and the love 
and the compassion, the concern of this centurion, it is out of the norm. And these elders say, Lord, he deserves for you to do this. And we see in that his compassion because that particular centurion's not asking for himself. He's asking for his servant. Now, when we read that, servants in the first century world were seen as property. I want to read a couple of things to you. And one from Aristotle that is, I think, shocking. <clears throat> the great Greek er philosopher Aristotle said, and I quote, there could be no friendship and no justice towards inanimate things, not even towards a horse, an ox, or a slave, because master and slave were considered to have nothing in common. A slave, Aristotle said, is a living tool, just as a tool is an just as a tool is inanimate, so is a slave. A Roman lawyer, Gaius, wrote this. It was universally accepted that the master possessed the power of life and death over his slave. And so, to most people, a slave was just a tool. When you wore out the tool, when it broke, you just discarded it. And some slaves, when they went beyond their prime, were just cast out. Some were left on the fringes of society. Some starved to death. Another Roman writer, Varro, wrote, The only difference between a slave, a beast, and a cart was that the slave talked. Now that comes from On Landed Estates, chapter 1, verse 6, 17. Can you imagine that? That you had so much disregard for a servant or a slave that you would say something that provocative, that heinous? The only difference between a beast, a cart, and a slave was that the slave talked? Wow. But this centurion didn't do that. The elders found Jesus. They put forth their case. They said, this man deserves it. And in that, I think they see a bit of their religion that can creep into any religion these days. If you worship God, then you deserve something. You do this for God, or you think you do it for God, or you live a, a moral life or a, a godly life, then you deserve for God to reward you or bless you or those things. Folks, the truth of it is, and I'm not trying to be down on myself or you, but we don't deserve anything but a cross. I'm so glad, so blessed, so thankful that God gave me what I needed rather than what I deserve. I deserve hell and eternal punishment for my sin, but God desired grace for me and he desired mercy for me. And so he sent his only son, this self-same Jesus, who while I was yet an enemy of Christ, he died on the cross so that I had the ability to choose to accept his gift of mercy or I could choose to live life on my own the way I want to. The Bible says that God commendeth his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so he's given us mercy when we did not deserve it. You know, I like this centurion, but I don't know if he deserved for Christ to heal his slave. That would be a blessing. That would be merciful. That would be a gift. But to deserve it? And that was revealing some of the idea and some of the theology and the religiosity of those in that day and ours. I still think about a man that I witnessed to longer ago than I'd like to think. I loved him, still do. Good man. Works in the racing industry. And <clears throat> he was going through some real troubles. We struck up a friendship and you know he was going through a really hard time in his family relationships and he came to me and I was so impressed he asked me to pray I prayed for him and his wife and his children and God was working in their lives and you know I'd always you know listen a great deal I can't tell you that every time I shared the gospel with him because sometimes you just need to listen and wait for that opportune time and I'd shared the gospel with him I'd shared about faith and he was not a follower of Christ, and <clears throat> he said, I just don't get this grace thing. And I talked to him, he said, well, it sounds good, but I just don't get it. He said, in my imagination, the way I see it is when I die, I'll go before God, and if the good things I did over here outweigh the bad things over here, then I'll get into heaven. 
But if the bad things over here outweigh the good things, then I won't get in. And I'd say to him, call him by name, you know, that might make logic on earth, but that's not what God has revealed to us through his word, through his son Jesus. We are saved by grace, through faith, not by works, lest any should boast. Salvation is at God's impetus, but it depends on us having faith in him. And repenting of our sins, you can't, I cannot do enough good work to deserve heaven. It's only by his grace that God intends that for me that I can be saved. You see, the centurion, he just said, Lord, I'm asking, would you, would you heal my servant? He's about to die. And the elders of the Jews could have said that, but they're weighing, look at the good things he does. He loves our nation when most Jew, uh, Romans hate us. He loves our nation. He builds our synagogue. He deserves this. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. It was from Jesus' mercy and love and compassion the same way it is for me and for you that he would be graced with that. Well, the elders, they say he deserves it. And we see a, a little bit about this centurion. He's a man of great means. I don't know that any of us could afford to build a place of worship for someone. He's a man of great means. He's a man of great generosity. I don't think he did it to incur favor. You know, they're occupied. They, they institute Pax Romana, the Roman peace by force. It's not a democracy. It's not something you vote on. But he has generosity and compassion for them and builds that synagogue. Well, the Jewish elders find Jesus, and then Jesus consents. He's going to go to the town. The scriptures tell us, verse 6, so Jesus went with them. They made their case, but Jesus is not going because the centurion is not like the rest. He's remarkable. He loves the nation. He built a synagogue. Jesus goes with him because he's going to heal this slave and because he is seeing that this centurion has faith. You don't call on someone you don't believe in. We read that from Hebrews, that chapter of faith, one through six. You don't call on somebody you don't believe in. And faith is a substance of what we hope for, the evidence of things not seen. It takes believing things you can't prove. This centurion cannot prove Jesus can heal his slave that's about to die, but he believes it. He's heard of Jesus. Perhaps he heard his teaching. He's a man of authority. And that very word is what the people saw that Jesus was. He preaches as one with authority, not just someone who can turn a phrase. And so Jesus goes with him, and somehow perhaps some of the elders went back to the centurion before they got there. There's a bit of a communication problem here because now when Jesus is not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. There's that word again, deserve. The elders, and I'm sure they were wonderful, they said, this man deserved for you to heal him. The centurion, on the other hand, being so humble, though he's a man of great means, a man of great generosity and of great compassion, he's the Lord, I don't deserve for you to come under my roof. I think he's also sensitive. Because if you don't know, in the rabbinic law, for a Jew to go into a non-Jew, a Gentile, that's what we are, if we don't have a Jewish heritage, Jewish parents or Jewish history, you're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. For a Jew to go into a Gentile house, it made them ceremonially unclean. You couldn't go to worship. There are certain things you couldn't do. You had to be quarantined, so to speak. And my goodness, we understand about quarantines after the last two and a half years, don't we? Not a fun thing. So to be defiled, to be infected by a Gentile, man, Jesus would have had to been separated from people for a while. And while the elders are not sensitive to that, they're just looking at the, you know, the end product, not the means. Well, we want Jesus to do that, and the centurion deserves it, even if you are defiled. No, 
The centurion says, Lord, I don't deserve for you to come to my house. And Jesus, I believe, was taken by that. He said, that is why I did not consider myself worthy to come to you. Isn't that amazing how humble he is? He commands a hundred men. He can put people in jail. He can confiscate your property. He can do what they want to do. He can compel you to carry his pack or his, his soldier's pack for a couple of miles, for a mile by law. That's why Jesus said if someone compels you to go one mile with them, go the second mile. It's where we take that thing. But no, he says, Lord, I wasn't just commanding somebody. I didn't come to you because I don't think I'm worthy of you. And Jesus sees the humility of this commander of men. Verse 7b, but say the word and my servant will be healed. Now that is amazing faith, isn't it? Say the word. Lord, you don't even have to come to my house. You don't have to lay hands on him. You don't have to anoint him. You don't have to speak over him. Just say the word and he'll be healed. That's great faith. When you know that the word made flesh, Jesus, that is the logos, the word, can speak a word and you can be healed. Speak those words we say to our hearts, Lord, come unto me all you who are heavy laden and burdened and I will give you rest. Come unto me and I will save you. Repent and believe and I will save you. And so he says, Lord, you just say the word, he'll be healed. For I, and then he demonstrates it. I think it's a wonderful thing. This is not just some fairy tale. It's not wishful thinking. This centurion has thought it through. He says, Lord, I myself am a man of authority. I say to one, go, he goes. I say, come, he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. He says, I know what it is to be an authority. And when Jesus hears this, he knows he's thought it through. He knows his heart. He knows he could be a man of arrogance, to be puffed up, to lord over his authority. But he is so humble that he sends others because he does not feel worthy of Jesus. When Jesus comes, he says again, Lord, I don't deserve for you to come into my house. Just say the word. Boy, in that faith. In that faith. Now, this is remarkable, folks, and I've read it, I guess, this, this time. It, it just captivated me. It happens that way with me, Scripture. I don't know about you, but every time, you know, I spend time and effort, and, and it, there's something to glean. Verse 9, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. <laughs> now, that's a turning of the tables. Usually, people are amazed at his words, for he spoke as one with authority. They're amazed that he had power over nature. He calmed the seas. He changed the water into wine. He had power over the elements. He had power over the spiritual forces, over demons. He had the power over illness. He had the power over disease. He had the power over death. He knows what it is to have authority. He has a power over all this. And they were usually amazed at Jesus, but now Jesus says... He's amazed at this man. Only two times I find in the New Testament that Jesus is amazed. One, if you go back and find it, Luke 6, 6. let's just look there real quickly. <clears throat> Luke 6, 6, on another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man, excuse me, I've, I've missed, it's taken on the chapter. Verse 6, uh, Jesus quotes, and I've, I've misquoted the text, but he says, that he was amazed by the lack of faith of those in his own hometown. There's a passage where Jesus says, and he could do no great miracle there because of their lack of faith, and he was amazed by that. This is the only place, other place I find that someone's amazed, that Jesus is amazed with someone else. He's amazed at the lack of faith of those living in his own hometown of Nazareth. He's amazed by the deep faith of the Roman centurion in Capernaum. This is Jesus finding faith. And when I entitled this sermon that, I had one friend call. He said, what do you mean Jesus finding faith? Are you, does that mean you're questioning his faith? Absolutely not. What I'm saying is that Jesus 
is he's finding faith. He's looking for faith. One powerful scripture that always challenges me is from Jesus' story, his parable about the persistent widow. You may know the story. I'll share a bit of it. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. Can you imagine that? This man's risen to the standing. He didn't care what God or people think. Doesn't care. Pretty arrogant, isn't it? And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. And for time and time again, he refused. But finally, he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Jesus says, listen to what the unjust judge says. And God will, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? And it's one of those comparisons and hyperboles that Jesus said. He, he's juxtaposing those. Verse 8, he says, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. And then a story about keep on praying and don't give up. There'll be a whole other sermon that I won't preach right now. But this is the pivotal part. Jesus is saying, don't give up. Be persistent. Keep praying. Don't give in. And to close it out, he says, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So Jesus is looking for faith in you and in me. He's not looking for people of great means and great standing and great accomplishments. Sometimes when we get those, we just don't care what anybody thinks. That's what this unjust judge, he didn't care what God or people thought. And he neither feared God nor cared how people would see that. But God cares. He says, if this unjust, careless judge will give you justice, how much more will God do it? But will God, will the Son of Man, will Jesus... Find faith on earth. Well, in Luke 7, he did. He said, this centurion, who's too humble to come himself, who's too re reverent to ask me to come into his house and thereby be defiled, if I see that kind of faith in him that I've seen nowhere else in Israel, isn't that encouraging? Because you and I, are that, we're Gentiles. We're seen as being unclean. As I've shared before, it just stuck in my mind from the first time I was taught this. That there was a prayer in the first century Judaism that said, Lord, the Jews would pray, thank you that I was not born a woman, a dog, or a Gentile. Can you imagine that arrogance? But God's just looking for folks. Jesus is looking for people with faith. That we believe he is, we believe he can, and we know that he will. Today's been a banner day. The mountains that we celebrated, God overcame for this church and for this membership was truly moving today, at, at least for me and I know for you. The miracles he's wrought and the faithfulness he's shown has been amazing. It's edifying, it's uplifting, but I know some mountains are still out there. And if you're facing a mountain, you need to know this. That when God, when Jesus teaches us about mountains, he says that if you've got the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be moved and it'll be cast into the sea. Jesus said, keep on keeping on. Don't give up. Don't give in. Folks, I know what that's like. There's one prayer that uh, I've been praying for a while. <clears throat> and I know. I know that God is faithful. I know that. I feel like that persistent widow sometimes. I think, you know, God just, maybe he's going to grant me what I'm praying for just because I'm pestering the fool out of him, you know. For that's what the persistent widow did. And he's, the, the judge said, not because of the right things, not because of what people think or even what God would think. I'm going to 
give this lady justice just to get her off my back. But God is saying that to my logic of maybe, maybe I'm just pestering so much he's going to grant. No, he's saying if an unjust judge will do that, how much more will God grant those mountains, those things that beset us? So what I'm saying is, friends, God sees your need. Jesus hears you. And he's in the healing business. Most of the trouble for lost people is that they're not looking for Jesus because he can be found by Jewish elders, by friends, by the centurion, by us. He's only a prayer way. And he'll give you much more than justice. He'll give us mercy because that's what I need. Perhaps that's what you need. But I know that every sinner needs the mercy of God, not the justice that we deserve. And so in just a moment, we're going to have an opportunity that if you've never received the mercy of God, it's at the ready. Jesus loves you beyond your sin. He loved me beyond my sin. And we are all sinners. The Bible says that we've all sinned to come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. You see, the world doesn't often understand that. I hear people say, God would never send anybody to hell. And I say, amen, that's the truth. God doesn't send anybody to hell. Folks who reject him choose to go there. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And you know just from human terms, you can't deserve a gift. If you think you deserve it, it's just someone, you know, I don't know, appeasing you, something like that, flattering you. A gift is given out of love from someone who loves you enough to buy it or procure it or, or make it, and that's what Jesus did for us. And Jesus is a gentleman. He won't force a gift on us. You have to choose it. And this is the way you do it, friend, if you've never heard. Or if those who are watching by electronic means here. In Romans 10, verse 9, the Bible says that if you believe in your heart, you believe that God is, you believe that Jesus is, that he's the only Son of God, died on the cross for your sins and rose on the third day. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. If you'd like to be saved today, Christ is at the ready. You can find him at your pew, but he calls you to profess him with your mouth. Whatever you need to do in responding to the call of Christ according to your need, would you do it as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation? <laughs> that God would have been honored by our worship and that you would have been encouraged and drawn closer to him. May God bless you and keep you. I love you and thank God for you. Pastor Ed. Hope that on your way in you received a copy of our messenger, the church newsletter, so that you can be informed of a couple of all the things that are going on in the life of this church. Just to highlight a few things, we're two weeks away from vacation Bible school, so if you haven't registered for that, you can register online, or there's QR codes around the church. You may have saw the bright, colorful piano outside. It has a big QR code that you can use to register for Vacation Bible School. And then on the Thursday, June 30th of that Vacation Bible School, everyone is invited for family night. We're going to be privileged to have Dr. Dan Bell Bellamy come and share his inflatable stories. He has an amazing ministry going across the United States, sharing amazing giant balloon sculptures, and he uses that to share the gospel of Christ. So I hope all of y'all will 
plan to be a part of that. Two things on the way out. Every Wednesday in July, we have something going on in kids' ministry, going to Dan Nicholas Park. We're going bowling. We're having a choir camp. And we're having uh, the very last one is the end of summer bash. It's for everybody as we celebrate together as a family of God. So pick up those so that you'll know about those. And then finally, on July 3rd, we'll be sharing the musical, The Torch is Past. There are invitations back there that you can give to invite people to come and be a part of The Torch is Past. Join me now as we pray together. Father, now may the Lord keep you from all evil. May he keep your life, and now may the Lord keep you your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Amen.